In this lecture, we're going to continue with constraint satisfaction problems. You remember a constraint satisfaction problem is defined by a set of variables, domains, in this case, 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, this is a scheduling domain. And finally, a constraint satisfaction problem is defined by a set of constraints. I've underlined two unary constraints, b does not equal 3 and c does not equal 2. But most of the constraints listed here are binary constraints, constraints between variables. A cannot equal B, and B cannot equal C, for example. We can have higher order constraints, ternary constraints, for example. Very often it's the case that these higher order constraints can be represented by multiple binary constraints. And so for our examples, it will be using binary constraints and unary constraints only. A constraint network is a graphical way of representing a constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, variables and domains are represented as nodes in a constraint network. Uh, constraints themselves are represented as arcs between these nodes. You'll see the defining constraint is represented in a rectangular box along these arcs. So, for example, on the far left, E must be less than A is represented as an arc between A and E. If you look in the top right corner at node B, you'll notice that B does not equal 3 is already taken care of. It's been removed from the domain of B. And likewise, C does not equal 2 has been accounted for in the revised domain for C. It does not include 2 anymore. And so unary constraints have been taken care of already. That work is therefore said to be domain consistent. In general, though, we can start with a constraint network like this and we want to take into account the various binary constraints. For example, in the middle of the diagram I have labeled 1. I'm asking about the implications of the constraint C is less than D on the variable C. Number 2, there in the top left corner, I'm asking what is the implications of the constraint A equals D on the variable A. In general, I'm going to go through this constraint network, constraint by constraint, variable by variable. And I'm going to ask for variable x, what are the implications on the domain of variable x given constraint c, where x is going to be somehow involved in constraint c. Pause the video and think, what are the implications of uh, c is less than d on the domain of c, and likewise for number 2, what are the implications of a equals d on the domain of A, and then restart it, and we'll talk more about what those implications are. So here in red, I've got an explanation for the implications for these various constraints on the variables that are listed. In number one, if you take a look at the constraint C is less than D, the question we want to ask is, is there a value of C for which there is no corresponding value of D which would satisfy the constraint. You'll see here in the domain of C I've crossed out 4. I've crossed out 4 because it cannot be paired with any value of D such that C is less than D can be satisfied. And so C equals 4 is removed as a possible value in the domain of C. If you go up and you look at the top left, the constraint is A equals D. In this particular case, there is nothing we can remove from variable A given the constraint A equals D. Every value of A has a corresponding value in D that would satisfy that constraint. 1 equals 1, 2 equals 2, etc. So we can't remove any values made of A given A equals D as the constraint, whereas we could in the first case. Here are three more examples in the bottom left. What are the implications of A not equal to B on the variable A? What are the implications of E less than B on the variable E? What are the implications of C less than D on the variable D? If you want to pause the video and think about that, uh, go ahead and then we'll address those additional three constraints in a moment. towards the top middle of the diagram. We're asking again, what are the implications of A does not equal B on the variable A? In this case, there are no values for A that we can remove. Every value for A has one or more values in B that would satisfy that constraint for the value 
A equals 1. In B, we have 2 or 4. That would satisfy the constraint. For the value equals 2, we have 1 or 4. That would satisfy the A does not equal B constraint, etc. And so we can't remove any values of A at this point, given that constraint. A does not equal to B. If we now look towards the bottom at the constraint E is less than B, and we ask what are the implications for that on the domain of E, we can tell that we could remove the value 4 from the domain of E. Why is that? Because for value 4 of E, there is no corresponding value in B that would satisfy the constraint E is less than B. When E is 4, the only possible values for B are 1, 2, and 4, none of which is properly less than 4. And so we would have to remove that. We wouldn't remove 3 because if E equals 3, we could still have a value B equals 4 that would satisfy the E less than B constraint. So 3 is not impossible as a value of E. 4 is impossible given the constraints. Finally, in the case of the constraint C is less than D and the implications of that constraint on the variable D, D equals 1 has no corresponding values in C in this case. You notice at this point, the domain of C is 1 and 3, assuming that we've handled the earlier constraints. C cannot be properly less than 1. So the value 1 is impossible as a value for D. So in total, for the five constraints we've looked at so far, uh, double check that these are the three values we would have removed given those five constraints and their implications on the particular variables they looked at. Now notice that we're not done yet. we still got a lot more constraints and their implications for a lot more variables. One of those is this situation of A and D and the constraint A equals D. We've already looked at the implications of A equals D on variable A. But when we remove the value from the domain of D, we have to go back and check again for the implications of the constraint A equals D on A. If you think about it, if we've changed the domain of D, this could have ramifications for the domain of A. And in fact, take a look at this and ask, by removing that value for D, what are the new implications for the domain of A, given the A equals D constraint? Under these new circumstances, where we have removed 1 from D, we would also have to remove 1 from A when we reconsidered the constraint A equals D. And so sometimes we have to revisit the implications of constraints on variables. Each time we've reduced the domain of one variable, we may have to go and look at the domains of other variables and what the implications are. Now even though we've looked at solving constraint satisfaction problems through search, there are other approaches that could be framed as search, but often aren't, for solving constraint satisfaction problems or for simplifying the problems in a way that would make it easier to solve by search. The generalized arc consistency algorithm is an example of an approach that is used to simplify uh, constraint satisfaction problems. We'll go into this in a little bit of depth through another example, a simpler example, but the basic idea is that we're going to be continually iterating through the constraints and their implications for variables one at a time. We begin with a very simple problem, not as complex as the one we were looking at moments ago. We've got three variables, A, B, and C, and we've got two constraints. A is less than B, B is less than C. Now notice here that there is a data structure called the TDA initialized to every constraint variable pair where the variable is in that constraint. So at first we're going to be looking at the implications of A less than B on A. We're also going to be looking at the implications of A less than B on B. We're going to be looking at the implications of B less than C on B. And we're going to be looking at the implications of B less than C on C. I've also got a variable here called not TDA. These are going to be the arc variable pairs that we've already looked at. And this corresponds, what I've written so far, to the first part, the initialization part of the generalized arc consistency algorithm. I'll just call it the GAC algorithm. In particular, you'll notice TDA in line 13 is initialized to the set of variable X constraint C 
pairs where the variable x has to be within the scope of c. It has to be referenced in c. So for the constraint a less than b, a is in the scope and b is in the scope, and I list those separately. So in the GAC algorithm, I'm going to be repeatedly going through these constraint variable pairs one at a time, uh, looking at the implications of the constraint on the variable. In lines 15 and 16, which are within the iterative loop, I remove a variable constraint pair, let's say a comma a less than b. I place that pair in the not TDA list, leaving only three constraints in the TDA list. I'm going to be considering the implications of a less than b on a, and so it's going to be the domain of a that changes, if anything. And what happens here is I go through the values of a, asking in each case, can this value possibly be associated with a value in b, such that the constraint a less than b is satisfied? Well, one can be satisfied because one is less than a number of values that are currently in the domain of b. Two is less than a number of values that are currently in the domain of b. Three is less than four, which is in the domain of b. But four, which initially is another value for a, is not properly less than any value in b. So I'm going to remove four from the domain of a. In general, I could remove more than one value, or no values at all. In this case, I'm simply removing a 4. Continuing on, I pull another constraint variable pair from the TDA list, mm -hmm. asking what are the implications of A less than B on B, and I place that pair on the not TDA list. The constraint variable pair I'm considering is the implications of A less than B on B, in this case, if b is 1, there is no corresponding value of a such that a is properly less than b. So I would remove the value 1 from the domain of b. The other values, 2, 3, and 4, can be associated with one or more values in a such that a is properly less than b. And so we don't remove them. The next constraint variable pair that I might remove from the TDA list is the implications of b less than c on b. If b equals 4, no possible value of c can satisfy the constraint b properly less than c. And so 4 is removed, and you'll see that at about the middle of the screen. Uh, the domain of b contains two values only, 2 and 3, which remain because 3 is properly less than 4, and 2 is properly less than 3 or 4. Now, after I reduce the domain of b, does this have any new implications for the domain of A, given the constraint A less than B? I've highlighted in black the constraint variable pair A, comma, A less than B, because I'm going to have to consider this constraint variable pair again. So I take that pair from the not TDA list, and I put it back on the TDA list, because I've got to reconsider the implications of A less than B on A. Next, I remove the constraint variable pair, asking about the implications of b less than c on c. If c is 4, then b could be 2 or 3. So c equals 4 stays in. If c equals 3, then b could be 2. So there is valid assignment there that would satisfy that constraint. But if c equals 2, there is no value in the domain of b that is properly less than 2. So 2 would be removed from the domain of c. Likewise, 1 would be removed from the domain of C. And finally, I'm going to be reconsidering the implications of A less than B on A. In this particular case, I'm going to be changing, if anything, the domain of A, which is highlighted here in red. If A is 1, then that is properly less than both 2 and 3, so 1 remains in the domain of A. If A is 2, 2 is properly less than 3, and so the value 2 remains in the domain of A. But if A is 3, there is no value in the domain of B that is properly greater than 3. So 3 would be removed as a possible value from the domain of A. I'm now done because the TDA list is empty. At the bottom, in a blue rectangle, is the final assignments for the domains of A, B, and C. A can be 1 or 2, B can be 2 or 3, C can be 3 or 4. 
In general, the GAC algorithm is not guaranteed to give you a unique solution. And in fact, it hasn't given us a unique solution in this case. We simply can't take a value from any of the sets and be guaranteed that it's a valid solution. For example, I can't simply draw a 2 from A and a 2 from B and a 3 from C and get a valid solution because the value of A in that case would not be properly less than the value of B. At the bottom I show the final set of four valid solutions. But in this case the GAC algorithm simplified the problem considerably so that search would not be as costly. Also finally consider the order in which I removed the constraint variable pairs to be considered. I could have removed them in any order and been assured of the same result.